But today, we are very pleased to host Tilly Walden, Walden sorry, uh, at the Norman Williams Library, and we celebrate her being appointed the fifth cartoonist laureate in Vermont. In Vermont <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, it's a three-year honor, and she follows in the illustrious footsteps of um, James Kolchaka, Ed Corin, Allison Bechtel, and Rick Beach. Is that how you say his name? Yes, Rick Beach. Um, Tilly was raised in Texas and moved to Vermont for the MFA program at the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont. And I want to give a quick shout out to James Sturm and Michelle Holly, who, who started the program, um, and all the other creative people there, who actually taught me as a reader, who didn't understand graphic novels at all, uh, how important the format is. Um, it's more than just the pictures or just the words, and it's the space or the interaction between them that give them their power. And uh, it's, a, it's a really important book that you guys are doing. Um, so, Tilly earned two Ignatz Awards in 2016, one of which recognized her debut graphic novel, The End of Summer, which she wrote when she was still a student and published in 2015. In 2018, when she was just 22, Tilly won the prestigious Eisner Award for Best Reality-Based Work for her graphic novel memoir, Spinning, which is a beautifully crafted story of moving on from her first passion, which was figure skating, and coming of age, coming out, moving forward. It's a beautiful novel. We shelve it in the young adult section, but it's really something, uh, it's been a long time since I was a young adult, and I <laughs> just think it's a very important, wonderful book. Um, her other graphic novels for young adults include On the Sunbeam and Are You Listening? <clears throat> she also created a children's book uh, with another cartoonist named Emma Hunsinger, and the book is called My Parents Won't Stop Talking. It's pretty funny. And she's currently working on a trilogy featuring the Walking Dead character Clementine and, who does not sit still, and she's collaborating with musicians Tegan and Sarah on two middle age, middle grade graphic novels. So, we want to hear about all of it. I'll tell you about all of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to sit. I also, if I sound out of breath, it's just because I'm pregnant. Um, and I will probably have to drink water quite a few times during this presentation. But that is just... That is just the state of my body right now. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. Um, I did not expect to be the cartoonist laureate. No one gives you heads up that it's going to happen. Um, and Ed Corrin actually recently passed away. So now there is one of our cartoonist laureates is, is no longer with us. But um, I also wasn't expecting to be the cartoonist laureate in the same year that I, my wife and I decided to have our first child. And I have two books coming out. So there's a lot going on. Um, but it's good. It's always better to have too much going on than too little. So I'm going to tell you a little bit. Oh, wait, do I point this? Aha, uh, I figured it out. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my career um, and how I got into comics. Um, the, the highlight being that I was never the kid who was the best at art in my class. So if you're not the best at art, it doesn't ever really have to hold you back. Um, but I grew up in the 90s and the early 2000s, and I think that every child and every person who becomes an artist or a creative person is influenced by what they love as a kid. So the things I loved as a kid is I loved Richard Scarry's work. It's still incredible to me. I certainly hope this baby likes Richard Scarry's work because that's what he's going to get to read. Um, and I don't know if anyone here has heard of a comic called Little Nemo in Slumberland. A couple of people actually have. Um, it's by Windsor McKay. It's from the 1930s. It is not recent. Windsor McKay is no longer with us. And I think by all accounts, he was a jerk. Um, but despite being a jerk, he made really beautiful comics, this comic on the right where that were all about a little boy's dreams. Um, and my dad got me a copy of Windsor McKay's book. And it was this big. And when I was like this big, I would sit on top of it and just kind of immerse myself in, in the comics. And little did I know that it was like turning me into a cartoonist. I didn't know that yet um, because I was busy being a figure skater. But I also read a lot of books that were targeted for boys. I should have known then that I was a lesbian, but it took me a few years. Um, but there's a whole, um, there's a lot of comics that are made in Japan that are meant for little boys to read that I really love to read. One of them was Dragon Ball Z. 
Um, another one was Buddha by Osamu Tezuka, which made me convinced that I was a Buddhist for about five minutes, um, which is a retelling of Buddha's life that is not accurate at all. And I didn't know that. It's totally fictionalized. Um, and I think I was really deeply influenced by the media that was made for kids at the time in the early 2000s. And I'm really happy that I was a kid when I was because it was right before like a lot of devices really took over. And I think it's when kids' cartoons were still kind of weird and no one was really paying attention to what we were making for kids. So stuff like um, Hey Arnold and Drake and Josh and As Told by Ginger, I just, I really adored all of it. I also loved The Simpsons. Um, my mom worked for HBO for 30 years and felt like she had no limits on the TV we were allowed to watch. So I watched Six Feet Under at a very young age. And I also watched The Simpsons at a really young age. And I thought it was just, I, I didn't get any of the jokes. So I just thought it was like a happy family. I didn't know that the dad was actually drinking beer. It looked like cola to me. Um, but I think that for some reason, I think The Simpsons and the colors of The Simpsons specifically, you'll see the colors here will appear in the work um, I did later on, which is sort of fascinating. And then, of course, the work of Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli was a humongous influence on, on all the work I've done. And one of the reasons it was such a big influence is, if you've never seen these movies before, lots of crazy things happen. There's a bus that's a cat. There's a castle that's in a sky. There's a dragon who's a boy. And never at any point does anyone explain how that happens. It just presents the world as it is. There's this level of trust with the person watching the movie, and that is something I've tried to imbue into my own work. Um, and I did not start drawing comics until I was about 17. I was busy being a figure skater, um, and I eventually quit figure skating when I was 17, and that was when I pivoted to make comics. And the entire reason that I make comics is literally because one adult was nice to me. My dad signed me up for a comics class, and he wanted to take the class, but he had to go to work. So he said, you take the class and you tell me what you learn from Scott McCloud, who is a very prominent cartoonist. I didn't know who Scott McCloud was at the time, but so I took this two-day class with Scott. I made the worst comic anyone has ever seen about a boy who turns into an octopus and then swims away. Um, and it made no sense, but Scott came up to me and he looked at the comic and he looked at me, and he was like, this is wonderful. You should stick with this. And literally, that is why I'm sitting here, because he was so kind to me. He was lying. I've looked back at the comic. It wasn't wonderful. It was incoherent. But I think what he saw was my energy towards making the comic, that I was having so much fun as I was drawing it. Um, and I went home, and I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what Scott said. I'm going to keep at this. I'm going to take the last year of high school, not do any of my homework, make comics instead. My grades plummeted. But my comics abilities really skyrocketed because I took the um, energy and discipline that I had being a figure skater, which was get up at 5 AM, practice for hours. If you fall, you get up and try again. And I started getting up at 5 AM and drawing comics because my body was already adjusted to a training schedule. I had quit skating. I've been to train at doing comics instead. And so that is how this is a lot of my early work when I was like 17, 18. Um, my drawing improved really quickly because if you spend four hours drawing every day, you're, you're gonna get better at drawing. It's, it's really just what's gonna happen. Um, and I decided that I didn't wanna go to college. I was gonna be a cartoonist. I was gonna move to Vermont. I told my parents all this, they were not okay with it, but at a certain point, what could they do? They couldn't like actually package me up in a box and sit, sit me down at a college. I was like, I'm gonna go to the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont. They were like, what on earth is the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont? And I said, it's an MFA program. And they said, you can't get an MFA, you don't have a bachelor's degree. And I was like, I know, but I can get a certificate. Because if you go to, you, anyone can go to CCS, where I now teach. It's a two-year program. You can also do it just for one year. You can just go and get a certificate in cartooning. And that is my highest form of education. So it's really fun in doctor's offices when they're like, what's your highest form in education? I'm like, certificate in cartooning. You don't have a box for that. Um, but so when I was 18, I moved to White River Junction. And because CCS is an MFA program, 
it's a place for people who are a lot older than me. And there's no dorms, there's no meal plan, there's no nothing. So I had to learn how to grocery shop, I had to learn how to get an apartment, I got a job cleaning hotel rooms, which turns out I'm also very good at cleaning hotel rooms. I'm good at comics, but I am excellent at cleaning a bathtub. I killed it. I could, I could turn over those rooms so fast. Um, Oh wait, I should explain this. So when I was at CCS, I was totally immersed in making comics and this was the first book that I made. Um, and at this point, my drawing ability had just sort of, I had found, I had found my voice. I wanted to draw architecture, I wanted to draw moody stuff, I wanted to draw sad stuff, I wanted to draw stuff about kids because I still felt like I was a kid, although if you had asked me when I was 18, I would have said I was an adult, I wasn't an adult. Um, and the only reason I was able to publish a book at, draw it at 18 and publish it at 19 is because I had been, my dad told me I should put pictures of my art on the internet. And I was like, okay, dad, fine. And so I put pictures of my art on Twitter and a random British man named Ricky saw one of my pieces of art and Ricky had decided to start a publisher with his friend Dave and he emailed me and was like, can I publish your comics? I was like, who are you? I lo it looked exactly like a, like a phishing email scam. It did not look legitimate. Avery Hill Publishing at that time had been around for just a few years. They only published in England. But I was like, what do I have to lose? Why not? It doesn't matter if it's real or not. Sure, publish my book. I was like, can you give me any money? And he was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, I'll keep working at the hotel and I'll do this book. But he said, I can't give you any money up front, but because I'm new at this, you're new at this, I'll give you 50% of whatever profit the book makes. I still make money from this book. I still get checks to this day, which is unbelievable. It took a few years, but no one would have told me that, that it could work out like this. I made this weird book. It came out in England. My mom was like, can I have a copy? I was like, I don't have a copy. It's in England. Um, I made another book with them. As soon as I finished that first one, the end of summer, called I Love This Part, um, because I was just, I felt like I was on a roll at this time at point. I was in my second year at CCS and this book was kind of a turning point for me as I think it is for like every queer creator where at a certain point you decide to put your identity in your comics and in the end of summer it was just a story about people. I didn't put any lesbians in it. I was very careful not to put any lesbians in it because I was just like I'm not ready to I'm not ready to like be a lesbian cartoonist. What does that mean? What does that do? But then after make the, the empowerment I felt from publishing that first little book, I was like, what am I so scared of? Why don't I, why don't I write a lesbian character? What, what bad is gonna happen? Um, and so I did. And I love this part is a book about um, two girls who are, are they giant or is the city itself small? I don't know what's going on. But they're in a surreal landscape and they're, they're in a relationship with each other. And it's based on the first relationship I had with a girl in middle school that we had to keep a total secret. Um, but this was, this was the turning point in my career because it's when I decided I'm not gonna be afraid to put queer characters in my books. I'm just, I'm just gonna do it. And they don't have to be me always, but this is a part of my life. And if I want it to be in my book, it will be in my book. And since then, every single book I've made has had queer characters because every time I'm making a decision about writing a character, I'm like, could they be straight? And I'm like, nah, they don't need to be straight. Um, it's just like, it's just kept going. I can't get off this hamster wheel. And it's become a real point of pride where my books are about all sorts of different things, but this through line of queerness is definitely in them. Um, and then I made one more book with Avery Hill Publishing uh, after I graduated, after I graduated from CCS. I don't know when I made this book, sometime around then. Um, and so that was the start of my career, these three little books. Uh, one about a sad kid in a castle, one about a, some gay kids, and I don't know what the heck that book's about, A City Inside, we don't know. It's a mystery. Um, but all of that led me to make my first American book, um, because at this point my books were still only available in the UK. They weren't, a, I don't even think you could get them online. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting that a lot of people's path to a career is circuitous. It doesn't always start with a book deal that looks great on paper or one that is explainable to your mother. You know, sometimes it starts out in England with two random men and, and then eventually that takes you um, to a bigger, a bigger and broader audience. And I went to England 
to go help promote these little books. And they sat me down at a table, and they were like, if people come up and they ask you to sign the book, sign the book. And I was like, you got it. Um, also, I was of legal drinking age in England, which I wasn't in America. So that's where I had my first drink. Um, and I learned very quickly that <laughs> alcohol is a lot. <laughs> you should be careful. Um, but it was while I was sitting there at this table that the girl next to me, there was another cartoonist there. She was like, who are you? I was like, I'm Tilly. She's like, I'm Isabel. She picked up my book. She read it. She was like, that's pretty good. I was like, thanks. She set it back down. And then after that convention, she called her agent. And she said, I met this girl, Tilly. You should look into her. And that's how I got my agent, because I sat next to a woman named Isabel who read my book in one sitting. Um, and then my agent, Seth, was like, we got on board. He said, I'm a literary agent. I'm going to help you publish books. And I was like, Seth, I've already published books. I've published three books. He was like, where are these books? This is not publishing. He was like, let's, let's go bigger. Let's go to America. He was like, I want you to publish a book that your mom can order on Amazon. Little did we know that the book my mom can order on Amazon is a memoir where she doesn't come across great. Um, but that's OK. She's totally coped with it. Um, and she's a total trooper. That's, that's a whole other story that I'm happy to get into. Um, but I decided that for my first big graphic novel, it's over 400 pages long, I would write about my experience as a figure skater. Um, so I was a figure skater for 12 years from the ages of 5 to 17. Um, and my figure skating life was enmeshed with everything that I had experienced growing up, a very rocky relationship with my parents, um, sexual trauma, bullying, coming out in Texas, um, a vaguely abusive coach, although I really avoided putting that coach in this book because I was still kind of scared of her, um, but then also a lot of beautiful things, friendships, my first relationship, um, realizing that I didn't have to be a figure skater if I didn't want to, realizing that you don't have to do something forever, even if you're good at it, you can still let it go. Um, but I was 20 at the time. I hadn't processed any of this whole 12-year nonsense in the ice rink. Um, so I wasn't sure how to tackle making a big book. At this point, I had only made small books. And I got the advice from James Sturm, who founded CCS, where I, where I went and where I now teach. And James said, don't write about figure skating. Just like sit down every day, get a piece of paper, and draw one memory from your childhood. That's it. He said, if it's not about figure skating, it's not about figure skating. I don't care. Just every day, draw one memory. That's all you're going to do. And I said, OK. And I was pretty daunted getting into it because I realized pretty quickly, every time I tried to even get close to drawing myself on the ice, I would have a panic attack. And I would specifically have a panic attack every time I started to draw my legs. And figure skaters have to wear these really skimpy outfits. You have to wear tights. And you're also not allowed to wear underwear, which is not something everyone knows about figure skating. Um, and there was something, it was, it was reaching some deep, dark memory of mine every time I started to draw my legs in tights on the ice. And I couldn't do it. And James was like, I told you, don't draw figure skating. Don't draw figure skating. You'll get there. Just draw other memories from your childhood. So I was like, OK. I'll draw like me driving to the rink with my dad. I'll draw a memory of school. I'll draw a memory of a TV show um, we watched together. And this, this is one of those memories that I decided to draw. It was me avoiding drawing the ice skating rink, which was that they brought all the skaters outside to run laps until we threw up. And you couldn't go back into the rink until you'd thrown up. Um, and that was, but it was like a way to start to access the trauma, to start to access the memories. And eventually, I, I hacked it. I can draw my legs on the ice now. And I, I feel like I decided to make this book really because I wanted to understand why I was so scared to talk about these memories. And I took this disjointed pile of childhood memories. I gave it to my agent. I said, I think this is a book about figure skating. I don't really know. Can you get me some money? Because I'm really sick of cleaning hotel rooms. He was like, I can get you some money. You don't have to clean hotel rooms anymore. He did. He got me $50,000. And I was like, I quit. <laughs> no more. No more of this. And I decide, started working with an editor. And that editor helped me turn all those memories into a coherent book. And I made like this sort of ugly rough draft of it. And all of that became this. And this is, this is what the book looks like now. Um, and 
I have not read it since I finished it. I, I can't actually quite recall everything that is in it. Um, it was a pretty delirious and intense experience turning this, um, all these memories into, into a book. Um, and I decided that the best thing to do was to trust myself. And I wasn't going, I was gonna lean into the fact that memories are imperfect, that I'm not gonna get everything right. In fact, I know I'm gonna get things wrong. And to just accept that fact, I decided not to look at any reference images. I didn't go back and Google my old house or my old ice rink. This is just what I remembered the ice rink looking like. And I ended up checking a few years later. I was like, is that actually what my ice rink looked like? I got pretty close, but you know what was wrong? Is this is so much bigger than it was. But it felt huge to me. The ice rink felt so huge. I always felt so small when I was there. I felt so lonely when I was at the ice rink. And I'm so glad that I trusted myself because the drawings in this book, their accuracy is emotional. Whereas like looking at the actual pictures of my childhood bedroom, sure, it's different. The bed is in a different location. But um, that was my goal with this book, was to lean into, lean into the emotions and it, it really worked out. This book has served me well. It was very hard for my family to read it, um, not only because of how my family is in it for just a tiny amount of the book. I really did the bare minimum. But even that small amount was very hard for them. And I, I knew it would be hard for them. But I also knew that I had a choice to either just keep living the life I was living with my parents, where we didn't have much of a relationship, or I could make this book and use this book as a conduit to try to break us open and like access each other again. And it, it worked. My mom read this book. She was devastated. She came to me and she was like, did you have a bad childhood? I was like, I did have a bad childhood. She was like, did I make you have a bad, like, was this my fault? And I was like, I don't know if it's all your fault, but there was definitely some stuff in there. And she was like, all right, we're going to therapy. My mom's from Queens. She was like, she found the, the only like New York therapist in Texas. She was like, we're going to this one. Um, and, and we worked together in therapy to like unlock all this, um, all this stuff that had happened. So spinning changed my life in such a positive way. And my mom and I are closer than we could ever be. Um, and the coach that was abusive that I was, is only just at the beginning of the book and then I quickly sort of move on. I did end up um, testifying against her and she did get like stripped of her coaching rights, which was great, that was lovely. So there is justice in the world. Little did small Tilly know that someday I would like fully, fully stand up to her, so that's great. And if you're wondering if I still skate, I do not skate. I don't like putting on those ice skates. It is a little, it is a little too close to home. Um, but once I finished um, spinning, I was sick of reality, sick of trauma, sick of ice skating. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna tell a sci-fi story. I'm gonna just put gaze in space and that's gonna be it. That's just what I'm gonna do. Um, and this is, this is me putting gaze in space and it's called On a Sunbeam. It's like, I don't even know why I write so many romances. I'm not even that romantic. Am I romantic? I don't know, but it's like a far-flung, star-crossed lover uh, situation. I, I was teaching myself to digitally color at the time, and as the book progresses, I add it slowly added in more colors in order to teach myself about coloring. A big thing I try to teach my students is that it, there's nothing wrong with learning in public. There's nothing wrong with learning while you're working on a book that's gonna be published. There's nothing wrong with trying out a new skill. The worst thing that happens is it doesn't look that good. Most people can't tell that it can't look that good because they don't have the same standard you do. So I, I was teaching myself a lot about the form through making this book. And this book turned out to be 700 pages long and the publishers were like, no, 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 no book spine can do that, it's too big. They were like, can you get it to 500? And I was like, if you can tell me where to cut, I can get this down to 500, and they did. They helped me get it down to 500 pages. Um, but working on On a Sunbeam, it unlocked this new idea for me, which is that drawing can be playful and drawing can be, um, surreal. I had been so stuck with drawing things realistically and in On a Sunbeam all the spaceships are fish because I can't draw spaceships. I still can't draw spaceships but I can draw fish so that worked out. Um, but drawing these like weird fish going through outer space led me to make things like this on the right in my sketchbook which um, 
which just, I don't know, it just unlocked something new in me. I think that um, as an artist, what you always need to remember is that you're never done, you never stop learning, and Sunbeam helped remind me all the stuff that I had yet to kind of learn and think about. Um, and after I made Honest Sunbeam, I made a book called Are You Listening, which is about uh, two people. They're gay, of course, um, but they're not in a relationship. Shocker. They are, they are merely friends um, driving through Texas uh, because I, I lived in Texas from when I was 11 to 18. And if you've ever been to Texas, has anyone here ever driven through Texas? A couple people? It's endless. It's so huge. You can drive in Texas for like 10 hours. Um, and I remember being a kid driving through West Texas with my dad. My dad is from Texas. And feeling like we had driven past the same gas station again and again in the same town. And there was something about the aura of Texas that I love and I care about, which is its, um, it's like its sense of independence, its massiveness, it, the scale, the scope, kind of, but the heat. But on the other side, Texas always felt like a really dangerous place for me. Um, and it, it was a dangerous place for me. I was not, I was not always safe there um, being an openly gay kid. And I got out of there as soon as I could, and I don't think I would ever go back, um, especially now that I have a wife and a, a child in me. It's just like, no, 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 too many laws we're getting close to that I don't like. Um, but Are You Listening kind of dealt with Texas as a concept, um, and again, sort of is about about trauma, but the, the fun thing that I got to do in, in Are You Listening is it's in a map of Texas where everything is totally moved around, so none of the cities are like in the right place, but that's always how Texas felt to me, um, was just out of control. And I kept drawing, and in between my books, I would fill sketchbooks with images like this. Um, I got uh, really good at doing this thing where I would just lay down color on a page with marker, and then I would go away and do something else, and then I would come back with a pen and try and fill in around it. So I would start with the color, and it was a lot of fun. And speaking of fun, this is a really hilariously saturated version of, of a page from my picture book. Um, the cartoonist I did a picture book with is my wife, Emma. Um, and uh, it was so much fun to collaborate. I had been making graphic novels on my own for so long. And how you make a graphic novel is you sit down and you chain yourself to your desk and you never get up again until that book is done. And working on this picture book with Emma was like, it was so freeing because she wrote jokes, I wrote jokes, she drew the characters, I drew the backgrounds. We were constantly sliding the paper back and forth between each other. The book was a total collaboration. Um, and it's all about uh, a little girl named Molly. We named the characters after our agents. My agent is Seth, her agent is Molly. It was all a big joke. And then they gave us a lot of money to publish it, which was really nice of them. Um, I, love, I love how these things turn out. But it's about Molly who, uh, goes out, out with her parents, and her parents see the neighbors named the Credenzas, and they start talking to the Credenzas, and Molly has just the most eternal meltdown because she feels like they're gonna keep talking to the Credenzas forever, and she wants to go to the park. This is her vision of what she could be doing at the park right now, but she's not at the park because her moms are talking to the Credenzas. Um, we have neighbors who look weirdly like their credenzas. It is not based on them. I love Arnie and Annette, and I love chit-chatting with them. This book came out before we moved to the neighborhood, but now Emma and I are so paranoid that Arnie and Annette think we made a book about them, when really we're the chatty parents now. We love to talk to them for ages about everything. Um, but she thinks that she's waiting so long that the Big Bang happens, like, like eternity. This is, I mean, it's, it's a book about patience. It's a book about how time feels when you're young, which is that when you ha are told you have to wait for 10 minutes and the adults are talking about their tomatoes and how they're growing, mm -mm, you're going to lose it. Um, and this was, this was just the most fun. So I drew all the background, and Emma just sort of plopped the characters in there. And it gets so far after the Big Bang because our editor was like, what about after the Big Bang? What, what's happening in Molly's psyche? She goes into nothingness. Um, because she's been waiting so long that all time ceases. And she, that is when she realizes that the message of the book is that she needs to be her own park. And she needs to be her own source of fun and inspiration. If her parents aren't going to stop talking to the goddamn neighbors, she's going to have to make fun within herself. That's Molly becoming the park, which is my favorite drawing of the entire book. Um, 
But that was, that's my picture book with Emma. It's called My Parents Won't Stop Talking. And we really do want to make more picture books together. Unfortunately, we're both so busy. Um, but that was just a fun interlude outside of My Parents Won't Stop Talking. I kept making comics. I kept drawing stuff, of course. At one point, I got a new blue marker. Obviously, I had to draw a lot of stuff in blue as soon as I got a new blue marker. And then this random job came knocking that I'm not going to say I regret it because this is on cable access, but mm, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, if you've ever heard of The Walking Dead, you may have heard of The Walking Dead. It's about zombies. Here's the problem. I don't actually like zombies. I think they're kind of gross, and I think they're kind of scary. And that's, that's the end of my feelings about it. <laughs> but um, I want my son to go to summer camp, and summer camp is expensive. So I agreed to do some books for The Walking Dead in order to build the future for our family that I want to have. And in that sense, I feel great about it because you know I, I, want, I want to be stable and I want to live the best life I can. And so I've made, uh, it's a three book series um, taking place in the Walking Dead universe. They gave me the character that I was supposed to work with, but I was allowed to do whatever I wanted with her. Um, and honestly, the most interesting part of the project is that if you've never seen The Walking Dead, if you get bit by a zombie, like right here, they have to like cut off your hand before the zombie invades the rest of you. And the character that they asked me to work with, Clementine, um, is an amputee because she's missing, she's a unilateral below the knee amputee, which means one side amputated. Um, and her disability ended up being the most engaging and interesting part of working on this project because I've never told a story about a disabled person before. And Clementine is a badass despite you know, her limitations. And I also was like, okay, if this project's gonna be hard for me to engage with, and I normally make all this like sensitive gay stuff, what can I do to make this Walking Dead book matter to me? And I was like, I know, I'll put it in Vermont. And as soon as it was in Vermont, everything lit up, and I was like, this is great, they're gonna go to Killington, because it's called Killington. That's perfect. My editor tried to change that, and I was like, it's a real place, you look it up. And I was like, the tourists are gone. It's just deer and forest, and this group of wily kids, including Clementine, try to make a home on Killington. It doesn't work out that well. Um, but that's okay. They do, at one, in one panel, walk through Woodstock. They go by one of the inns, kind of on the main road, but it's not accurate because they're walking the wrong direction. So if you see it, you'll be like, you're not walking towards Killington, you're walking the other way, but just pretend with me. Um, but it was so fun to set a book in Vermont um, because at this point Emma and I had bought a house and we had decided we want to like really live here for a long time. Um, it was before I became the cartoonist laureate that, uh, but I was just like, I, I feel like Vermont would do really well in the apocalypse. I feel like the, the landscape was something that I really wanted to just spend a lot of time drawing. And that's what I got to do. Um, so that's, that's Clementine. Um, I think the only other sort of interesting part of the series is that, um, so nowadays, if, if you need to, you can ask your publishers basically to hire people to help consult on your book. And I was like, can I talk to some amputees? Because I don't actually know what life is like as an amputee. And they were like, yeah, let's talk to some amputees. Um, so I ended up talking with um, a group of amputees who I've become very close to, who everything about her experience being an amputee in the book is from them. It's directly their experience, where they were like, I had this one moment and this thing happened with my prosthetic. It was crazy. Um, and it was so enlightening and so inspiring to be, to be able to like use what I can do, which is comics, to translate their experience onto the page. Um, and I. I'm happy I did this project now, especially because I've learned so much about their experience. And the way I make Clementine is I draft out the book um, really, really quickly on an iPad, because I don't have time for anything these days. Um, and then I ink it traditionally on paper um, with really bad pens on pretty bad paper. I don't know why. I, I know I have money for pens now, but there's just something in me where I'm like, I'm gonna use the cheapest paper I can. Um, but this is from book two, um, where Clementine is underwater. 
Um, and in book two, they go up to Canada, and in book three, they're going to Greenland. So I've pushed past Vermont. I love you, Vermont. I'm so sorry, but I needed to like continue to draw new and exciting environments. But everything I draw is traditional. Um, I draw on paper. My wife, Emma, also works totally traditionally, which makes us both, we're both kind of outliers in an industry that is largely digital um, at this point. But it's, oh, there they are at Killington. There's a ski lift. That is exactly what the ski lift looks like. I know because I went to Killington and took a picture of it and then went home to my studio and looked at it and made sure, made sure it was correct. Um, but that's Clementine, and they're, I don't, know, I don't know what else to say about those books. They're, they're wild, they're out there, but it's, I really have learned a lot with them. Um, and while I was working on Clementine, I also, I don't know if, if anyone here has heard of Tegan and Sarah. They are, yeah, they are a, a queer pop duo. They are not dating each other, they are identical twins. I have been asked that multiple times already. They're twins, they're related, they're from Calgary, Canada, and they, I mean, they wrote these books because the publisher was like, do you wanna just like write some books real quick? They were like, okay. And then they asked me to illustrate it, and I was like, I can illustrate a book super quick, let's do it. Um, and it became this absolutely adorable and wonderful project for me because they're so sweet, their whole childhood is so sweet, I got to draw the book in this super cartoony style. This is one of the rough draft pages. Um, and this is what it looks like with finished art. It's the first book I've drawn entirely in pencil. So all the lines are really soft. And I'm a twin too. I don't think that's come up also. So as a twin and with us all being gay in the room, I was like, this is, this is great. Like this is just a lot of common elements. And the project was truly I mean, my book with Emma definitely wins for most fun, but this is very close second um, for like the most delightful project I've ever worked on. Um, it's also the first project I did without panel borders. If you can tell, there's no borders around each image. What happens when you're married to someone who also draws is I see the way she draws and I'm like, that looks more fun than the way I'm drawing. So Emma, my wife, does not draw with panel borders. She draws everything in this really open, beautiful way, and I kept seeing her do it, and I was like, that's so cool, and she was like, you're allowed to do it too, I don't mind if you also want to do a book without panel borders, I was like, great, I'm going to do it, um, and her book isn't out yet, but when it comes out and you see it, know that that's where it originated, the no panel border thing, because this book came out before hers, but that's entirely because everyone was rushed on this book, and she's not rushing on her book, um, but it's great, it's great to get inspiration from your loved one. It's great to like realize that there's so much potential for other, other kinds of layouts. I feel like my pages look totally different um, without the restriction of a square around it. It's just like so, it's such a small thing, but I think about this all the time. Um, and while, so to, to kind of wrap it all up, I've made all these books, I did not think that these books would lead me to being the cartoonist laureate. I haven't really expected that these books would like keep leading me to continued opportunities. I think I always sort of thought that, you know, each book I make, it could be the last one. If a book doesn't sell, publishers really don't want to work with you again. And so I've never assumed that like my books will always sell and they really don't always sell. Some of my books have sold well, some of them really have not. Um, but it's kept going and I've, I've turned what was really just an interest and a love for comics into a fully fledged career at this point. I've published 10 books, um, which is totally, totally wild. And I was really surprised when they said I was the cartoonist laureate because I was like, you know I'm not from Vermont, right? And they were like, Alison Bechdel's not from Vermont. And I was like, you're right, she's not from Vermont. She's from Pennsylvania. And I was like, but she was the cartoonist laureate. And they were like, it's not about that. It's about people who are here in Vermont right now making comics, who care about where they live, and who want to try to like bring some of Vermont into the work they make and use the work they make to connect to other Vermonters. And so in that respect, I was like, all right, that's cool. I think that's super cool. I got to meet the governor, and they swore me in uh, as the cartoonist laureate on the, the like legislature floor. 
The same day that they were swearing me in as the cartoonist laureate, they were also honoring a girls basketball team that against all odds won at the finals. And so they like had me stand up and clapped and then they were like, and now the girls, the basketball team and all these girls stood up that I was like, where did they come from? And I was so happy for them, these little basketball stars, they were so excited. So everyone in the legislature was thrilled that day because there was a lot of local pride for the basketball team and, and I guess for me. Um, and yeah, I'm happy, happy to answer any questions um, you all may have. How did I do? That was like 40 minutes long. That was pretty, that was pretty solid. Um, I am going to take a sip of water because I'm very thirsty. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any questions about that? I'm also happy to talk about CCS as a program if anyone is interested in it. Delicious. Yes. You, you um, I think, very graciously um, spoke about people who made the difference, who made you continue, yeah. um, who gave you confidence in yourself, but also who gave you assignments. For instance, don't write anything. Don't draw your eggs. Yeah. So, um, do memories. Um, do you have certain ways that you now incorporate what they did for you into your teaching? Absolutely, absolutely. So I teach in the school year at, at CCS and then I also teach a workshop every summer that's like a queer comics workshop. So it's specifically for um, people interested in making queer comics. And I realized that a lot of the mentorship I got wasn't really about my art. It was them validating who I was as a person and they were giving me confidence regardless of where I was at in my journey. And so that's so cheesy, but it's true. Um, and so the thing that I try to do now for my students is to kind of look past where they're at in their comics journey and see what they need right now to keep going. Because there's nothing worse for me than when a student gives up. Unless they actually want to give up and they're like, I'm going to go be a writer. And I'm like, great, go be a writer. I love that. But if they're giving up because they don't believe in themselves or they don't think they're good enough, that's when I have a problem. So I think a lot of my teaching is about nurturing um, them as people before them as artists because it all translates. If I can give them confidence in their process, then the way that they're going to actually draw comics is going to improve. It just is because they're going to feel better about it. Um, I think I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty maternal teacher. I think if any of my students were here, they would agree. And I think it's because the people who guided me were especially paternal or maternal, they were like, there was a, a sense of, like, they actually cared about me. And so I try with my students, and I do actually care about them. They make me crazy sometimes, but I do. I, I really care about them, and I think that's, that's kind of what I've passed on. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I love that concept of a teacher as being someone that doesn't just funnel the student into whatever their area of specialty Right, like, like, like getting the good grade. Like, how can your talents like work in this area and you see that that's something that they are geared towards something, you know, slightly yeah. parallel to that. Totally. I really love that concept of teaching. Thank you. I mean, it only works at a small school. Yeah. CCS is a small program. I have one-on-one -on -one time with all my students every year. And it, if I was... I think overwhelmed with students and with classes, it wouldn't be possible. But when you have a model of like a smaller room, it's totally possible. I want to know everything about my students, about where they came from, where they want to go. I missed the beginning. Yeah. And, um, I'm sorry, that was on me if you repeated, if you already said this, but I read Spinning and mm -hmm. you know, told a lot of people about the story and just thought it was really amazing how you were on this trajectory had this like feeling mm -hmm. and it's like your parents weren't these like hippie like how are you feeling you know like what are you interested in she's no. like this Russian parent and yet you ended up like going in the right direction like yeah and I I feel like there was there a teacher in spinning I'm sorry I don't remember. there was a cello teacher yeah named Victoria that's actually her like, name over like a year and a half or two years ago mm -hmm. my memory's not that great but um yeah I was just yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know why some people, yeah, I don't know also why like some people have hard childhoods or experience trauma and it, it throws them off for the rest of their life and some people 
find a way to harness it, um, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in toxic ways. Um, I, I don't know, I think I felt like after everything that I experienced and everything that's in that book, I was like, why would I ever waste another day of my life doing something I don't want to do? I think that's such an amazing thing to realize. Yeah. Like, yeah. At that age, because I feel like there's so many people that don't realize that even until later. Like, that's I was like, tired. Like, yeah, I mean, if for anyone who's done either sports or lived a very intense, um, driven childhood, you, you may understand that like, you put a lot of hours in each day. I felt like I was 35 when I was 17. I was like, I'm exhausted. It's time, it's time for me to like change my life. It was kind of my midlife crisis at the time. Yeah, yeah, I felt old. But then, but then I was able to like, I was able to start over. And actually the sort of the hard part or the, the part that I had to eventually learn how to contend with was that I took my attitude towards skating and I applied it to comics. And I went after comics. You don't publish 10 books in 10 years without sacrificing something. And I sacrificed so much of a social life and so much of the like social and emotional learning that you do when you're in college, because I didn't go to college. I, had, I still have never really been, I mean, I've been to parties, but I'd never been to a party. There was so much that like halfway through all those books, I was like, in one respect, I've come so far. And in another respect, I am missing so much, so much. And I need to like, I need to recalibrate what's important to me because I have made books important to me, but I haven't made other people important to me. And it was when I kind of made that decision to sort of change course and open myself up. Thank God, knock on wood, I met my wife and then I was done dating. It was perfect. Um, but yeah, you, it's great to be successful, but there is a cost to, to spending all your time devoted to like one thing. There's a lot more. Publishers realize that they can make some money off of graphic novels. And now, it used to be comics were just in comic book shops or like the drugstore. And now, I mean, it first started with graphic novels getting in like Barnes and Noble. And now independent bookstores have huge sections with graphic novels. Sometimes graphic novel sections are now so big, they divvy up which are for adults and which are for young readers, which did not happen. The rise of, kid, of comics for kids is, a recent and trackable occurrence that all started with one author named Raina Telgemeier, who made a book called Smile that every child in the world read and loved and made publishers so much money that all of a sudden they were asking all their cartoonists who were making stuff for teens, they were like, can you go younger? Can you make a comic for kids? Because Raina did it and it made us so much money. Um, but on the, the other side of that is publishing has really come around to marginalized voices. So people of color, queer people, disabled people um, are getting book deals when they weren't getting book deals before because it, it also used to be that around the time I made Spinning, they really only wanted memoirs from queer people because they were like, tell us the coming out story. That's, I mean, this was the it gets better moment. That was like the height, this was before marriage equality or had marriage equality, I don't fucking know. Um, maybe we could have gotten married, I'm not sure. But it was a point when being gay was interesting as a, like a side thing. And now I'm being asked to work on The Walking Dead. I'm being asked to do so much more than coming out stories. So in that respect, the publishing industry has absolutely transformed itself. If I was gonna be cynical, I would say that I don't think, I think that while that has happened, publishing hasn't prioritized the art element as much. I think that a lot of graphic novelists don't have the time they need to illustrate their books as beautifully as they would want to because they just want to get the books on the shelves. Um, so the next step is in France, cartooning is considered on par with painting. Um, it is considered an art form absolutely that high. I would love to see that in the United States of America because it is no, there are so many museums that would never go near a comic because it's a comic. They still think that it's for kids. They think it's junk. They think it's not literary. So that's what, I, that's what I'm aiming for is people respecting comics as a true art form.
Yeah. Have you been to Japan? My wife, uh, uh, I didn't notice this myself when yeah. I was in Japan, but my wife went to a bookstore that was all graphic novels and yeah. there were children of all ages lying around on the carpets reading the books and you see them on the subway, yep. grown ups reading graphic novels. Graphic novels are a big, big deal. They're huge. I have been to Japan, and it's they they call comics in Japan manga, which is just the yes. Japanese word for comics. But oh yeah, it's. I mean, if that could happen here, I'm not even going to hold my breath that it could really happen in the United States. But it's incredible the respect that they show towards their art form. And you know what's incredible about comics in Japan is they're almost all black and white. And for some reason, American publishing still thinks kids won't be interested if there's no color in it. And I have been telling them that's not true. Kids love drawings, kids love stories. You don't need rainbow colors everywhere unless you want rainbow colors everywhere. My but. daughter tells me that it's the stories. Exactly. Attracted her. In the beginning, it was Miyazaki's work. Oh, yeah. When she was in second grade, she saw it. The words at the bottom were a foreign language. Yeah. The librarian told her, you can't take this out. What? You'll never be able to understand it. She <laughs> argued, she got it. She hid it under her pillow because Good she for her. can't take it away. <laughs> and I discovered she liked manga. And she yeah. She began to buy it at the bookstore. So we sent away and got free dictionaries for it. She began to translate. By the time she was at, Hart at, Hart at uh, Hartford Middle School, yeah. she, there was the manga club. Oh, I love club. that. They, we traveled down to New York with 15 kids and all went, and they changed their costumes every Oh, every that's right, cosplaying. They all <laughs> costumes. They had two a day. Yes. They so into it. Oh, these kids are hardcore. The manga go from the back of the store at, at, border, at uh, Barnes and it was Borders then. Yeah. And Linda Shirley was the manager, and then they slowly grew in size. Now if you go to Books mm -hmm. A Million, which is a successor, mm -hmm. it's all in the front so you can see it. I know. And Newbury Comics next door has manga posters up and manga action figures. Oh, so yeah. So lots of people are reading cartoons. Graphic novels are a growing thing. Yeah. Um, another uh, comment that I would make is, given your own background, mm -hmm. supplements what I learned when we went to job tech. Mm -hmm. uh, they repeatedly told me, we don't care what your degree is in software engineering. Yeah. We want you to show us what you can do. And you showed them what you can do. That's exactly it. No one has ever in 10 years asked where I went to school. Sometimes I tell them I went to the Center for Cartoon Studies just because it's a funny name and I want them to be like, what's that? I'm like, I'm going to tell you what that is. It's in a post office building in White River Junction. That's what that is. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to be in an art form that doesn't care about my resume. Also, I teach at an MFA program now, and I don't have a college degree. But it's because, and I've had, I've been offered teaching positions at other universities, again, where they have not checked to see if I've gone to college, which technically you're supposed to do if you're going to teach at a college. Um, but it's about the work that I've made, and luckily that's, that's stood for itself. I did because they, they said off the bat, and I don't think I would have agreed to the project if they had said otherwise, they were like, the only thing we'll ever really edit is if the zombies are wrong. They were like, if the zombie mechanics are off, Robert Kirkman, who made The Walking Dead, he was like, they were like, Robert's not gonna like that. But they were like, anything else, your, the world is your oyster. Do whatever you want. I mean, I, I, got, <laughs> I got so far. Rabbi Haig is here, so this is relevant. But um, in book two, they let me have a character like try to rebuild a synagogue, and like they try to have a bat mitzvah, but none of them can remember what happens in a bat mitzvah. So there's so much of the book that they're just like trying to figure out what a bat mitzvah is. Um, it has nothing to do with zombies, and it was so it was so liberating that after they read the draft, they were like, "Where did this bat mitzvah come from?" And I was like, "I don't know. It's just there." And they were like, "I love it." They didn't take it out. They were like, "It's great." A lot of the book, a lot of the book deals with, uh, yeah, no one re really remembering. And one of the characters, Rika, who's named after a, a member of my family, she like she knows she's Jewish, she knows she's Sephardic, and my family is Sephardic. So my mom was very pleased that I put that in one of my books. She was like, "About time!" And then she called her cousin Rika and was like, "Rika, you're in the book." Um, but it deals with like, how do you remember where you came from if you only had it for just a few years? Um, you didn't know to pay attention. Yeah, you didn't know to pay attention. Yeah. But it's exciting to write because then, like, these kids are basically reforming what 
like faith is for them because it's up to them now. Because if there's no one to tell them what their culture and history is, then they have to take what they remember, take what they know now, and turn it into something that's important. So that was such a fun part of the book to write. It's my favorite part of, of the second book. Yeah, that makes me want to read it. it comes out in October. <laughs> I think the thing I want more than anything is for teachers and librarians in every corner of the country to see comics as reading, um, because I think that's sort of the final hurdle. And there's so many places where that is true, where comics are in school curriculum, um, and, and teachers love using them, and librarians love them. But there are still places I go where it's, not, it's just not seen as, as the same reading as reading a book. And so what I don't, I don't want for comics is for our art to be worth $50,000 because I think comics has this, this, this dingy grassroots feeling, which is that it's, we started out you know, in newspapers, we started out in drugstores, and that, that history really matters. So regardless of what comics sell for, I just want them to feel that respect and admiration that, I don't know, what, what gets seen as like a real artist, you know? And I think it'll happen with time, and I think it's already happening. I can sell my original art. That didn't used to be a thing. People buy pages from my books. I do not have most of the art from my books now because I've sold it all. It's really interesting. Do you get directly notified? No, they don't tell you. You have to find out. No. No, no one will tell you, and the only, you'll only find out through circuitous methods. So, like, I, I found out from different people for, like, different school districts. It's, it's only been in three states only, um, Texas, Florida, and I think Missouri. Um, and Have you fought I, against the whole, like, the Texas thing? I mean, no. That's, it's so weird. No. There's nothing, I think there's, there's really nothing I can do directly because... I'm not in these kids' lives, and it's not, it's not my local school. Obviously, if it was a school here, as if it would be, there's more I could do directly. But I really disagree with how some authors feel about it. There's a, I have a lot of friends who have books who are banned, and some of them, their reaction is like, it's a badge of honor. And for me, they're like, oh, welcome to the club, like best club, our books are banned. And I was like, for me, it's just a tragedy because it just means that one less kid gets to read my book. And it's like, I don't know if they were gonna read my book regardless, but I find it really, really sad. It really just sort of makes yeah, me sad. It, I it, I yeah. I mean, it makes, it makes some people really angry. I've always felt like it's, it's definitely veered me towards sad more. And the only way I've been able to actively fight against it is I convinced my publishers with On a Sunbeam, which is the sci-fi book I did, that's very, it's very positive, kids can read it. Um, I convinced them to let me put the whole thing for free online while also publishing the book. And it's still up there. It's just a 500 page book on a website that, and I know, because I can look at the statistic, it's just, I can see where kids, you know, IP addresses originate from and where they're reading it. And so that's the only way I can fight back is making my books free because then you don't need a credit card, you don't need an adult, you don't need um, a gatekeeper. And so that makes me feel better, but I had one experience that I think was illuminating and, and makes me feel like it's, it's going to be difficult in that I went to a school district in Texas where I, I, was, told, I was told it was just a regular book event. I had no idea that the principal had already read my book and taken it off the shelves and I showed up and he, he pulled all the kids out. I was in an empty cafeteria and all the kids were told to go somewhere else. And all the doors to like different classrooms were lo like, locked. I couldn't get anywhere. And the book, the bookseller who was with me was like, I don't know what's going on. And I was like, we'll figure out what's going on. And I tried, I tried to go to the principal's office to just talk to him and say, what's going on? Like, why did you ask me to come here? Like, what's going on with, with, what are you worried about, about in my book? I really, I didn't want to be adversarial. I just wanted to have a conversation and he wouldn't see me. And we had to just leave after. It was so upsetting. And it was like, oh my God, like if you can't get past, but luckily kids aren't in school all hours of every day. So it's true that like getting it to different bookstores or libraries around in these sort of contentious districts, but the list of the books that they've banned is long. My book is, is one of many. They've done to sway the voters, not especially for this time. Yeah. Other people have yeah. And you have, we can do last question. Uh, 
Um, I have a great idea. Yeah. There's a link to your book, right? Yeah. Um, the one that is. That's free, free, yeah. Right, a free link. I can see going through every bathroom in Texas. And <laughs> just writing it on there? That's genius. I love that, yeah. Let's do that. That'd be great. What a wonderful way to end. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. This is wonderful.